book has just come out. Yeah. What motivated you to, after all these years, to, to write the book? Well, it's uh, it, mainly other people, uh, family, you know, that want to know what happened in the 60s. That I was quite successful in certain businesses in them days. I made a lot of money from the ice cream in the West End. I used to run several vans, uh, plus about 20 barrels. Um, so I made a lot of money. I bought a lot of property. I, uh, I ended up having about 40 properties in London, which we let at bed sits. Um, and a lot of confrontation with the police. Not something I chose, obviously. Let's take us all the way back to the beginning, but we want people to dip into the book, obviously, at certain times. Of course. Uh, born and brought up where? I was born in uh, London, Kensington. My mother uh, was carrying me when she came over from Spain. My mother's Spanish. Um, she actually died about um, six months ago and uh, she was 99 and a half, so she, she lived a long time. Obviously she was in England for 72 years. Still had a Spanish accent when she left, and if you ever came into our, into our family home, which lots of people did, you would hear half a conversation because we would speak to her in English and she would respond in Spanish, or she would ask us something in Spanish and we'd respond in English, and that was a regular thing. Um, we were brought up in, uh, well, we were evacuated to Ireland during the war. My brother was born in London before we went to Ireland. My sister had already been born in Gibraltar, my older sister. Um, and then we went to Ireland. I suppose we must have been there a couple of years. After the war, um, my dad came home from the army, took us back to London. We lived in a bit of a hostel for about nine months. Then they got a council flat in Marylebone and we were brought up in Marylebone. Um, until my 14th birthday when we moved to Ockenden. So those, those mother's character, was that somebody, what did you learn from your mother? What the influences from your mother? Everything stems from my mother. I mean, my, my father was a police officer in Gibraltar when she met him. Um, he was, uh, well, he was, uh, he was a sergeant in the police, but he was discharged from the police for smuggling tobacco from Spain to Gibraltar. It was the police and the dock officers that were doing the main smuggling and that. And they used to bring them into the docks, load them onto an ambulance, sirens go in, the gate officers would be involved, they'd open and let them through and that. But at some time or another, they were stopped by a gunship. Somebody had shot them and my father was thrown out Gibraltar. He couldn't go back there for 10 years. He, uh, I was never much good at school. You know, I was always brilliant at maths. I, I had a natural for maths. I could leave everybody in the class behind, even the kids at the top of the class and everything else. And maths, I just... I was at school? What at school? Then? I had a million jobs. Uh, I got into a little bit of trouble um, with a few local people and ended up in Chelmsford Court, where I was sent to Bolston. I, um, what actually happened, there was about six or seven of us involved. I was the youngest, I was only 18, the rest were grown men. Um, and I wasn't pulled out. I wasn't pulled out on, a, on an ID parade, um, but they charged me anyway and took me along. And then when I got to court, the barrister said to me that he had had a word with the judge, and if I pleaded guilty, I definitely wouldn't get custodial. So being green and stupid at that age, I accepted. And then, of course, when it was the judge's turn to hand out whatever it was, he gave me Borstal, um, and it turned out. Uh, I finished my Borstal. I came out. Um, I was working for a company called Bastiani's in Grays, selling ice cream. I found I was good at it, I was good with people, good with kids, I used to get waiting for me, I'd have a gathering and that. Then I moved to a, a, a round in Dagnum, which was excellent, because in them days everybody worked at Folds, so there was lots of money in that area, and, and it showed in the takings I took compared to other rounds. So I, I did quite well. I was unemployed, I worked through the winter uh, driving an oil tanker where I was getting £18 a week time I paid, um, I think, a tenner to the wife indoor, the five for rent, I was left with about two quid a week, it was all the skin. That winter, I bought an old Trojan ice cream van that was laid in a, in a garage near, near um, Basildon for quite a long time, I'd seen it a few times. I took that home, hand painted it, signed Richard ourselves, my dad worked on the diesel engine, and at the beginning of 1964, that was my first van. First, the first week when I went to work, the first day I went out was a Saturday, and I took 40 quid. Uh, 
and run out of ice cream about four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and I thought, lovely. The so next day I took extra stock, I still ran out, it was a Sunday, I ran out, and I took 60 quid, just over 60 quid. So in them two days I took about 100 and odd quid, which paid for the van, the insurance. So, so far we've got a good news story about a growing business. Yeah. There's a problem coming though, isn't there? And people will want to know, how did a good news story about this end up in a war? Um, well, the ice cream, all over the country, I mean, you can go and, you can go and get stories about the ice cream. Um, you know, ice cream men on rounds argue about who's on each other's time or whatever it is. Street traders everywhere in the country. There were big battles in Scotland over ice cream turfs and all that. And basically what it was, I went there, I had X amount of pitches which I protected. I did not allow other people to push us off or to come on. And so there were times, obviously, when you talked to some of the foreign guys that were trying to get on there, Italians, Greeks, Turks, um, they didn't understand what we would say to them. They would want to argue about everything. So the policy after a few times of that is we don't argue. We tell them once. We ask them nicely, because otherwise that's why you didn't ask. So we ask them nicely. That doesn't work. We then tell them politely, fuck off. Not only that, I also started buying houses. The first one I bought for £1,800. The guy was in a bit of trouble, I was in the cafe, I was talking to him, a friend of mine, um, and he was in a bit of trouble and he had this house which was on three storeys. Um, so we had a deal and I bought it off him for 1800 quid. Lovely, I made them into bed sitters, then I got the bug. After that I wanted property. So, as I was, but of course what happened there is we probably got too big for our boots, Scotland Yard decided they had to do something about it, so they formed a special squad. Uh, they did observation on us for four or five months, came up with nothing. The police came up with no observations at all, although they showed they had people there. No evidence from anything the police had seen, just what they got the Italians to say, that we'd threatened them mind about the fact that when you did fall out with them, he threatened um, you with his brother, who was part of the Mafia and all of a sudden you give him a right hander and he wants to scream, police, police, right, this man <coughs> hit me, so, you know. But when an Italian mentioned the word Matthew, were you never slightly concerned or worried? Yeah, I thought I'd better chin him before he goes any further. So, uh, you know, as far as I was concerned, he was just getting cheeky, getting mouthy. Uh, and, then, and then, what about, sorry, what about the building up of your organisation? Was it difficult to know who to trust and who not to trust? Um, Yes, but we weren't doing anything illegal. I mean, we were because we were, we were trading without licences and that. But as far as the ice cream concerned and the properties, it, was no, it wasn't a big legal organisation. Yes, I earned a lot of money. It was a straight business and the properties were straight businesses. The problem was everything I touched turned to money. So once I started buying all sorts of properties, that brought in more money. The ice cream was bringing money. We went into the hot dogs and hamburgers, that started bringing in money. We opened the scrapyard, that started bringing money. Taxi firm, more money. Transport company, more money. Well, how would you have described, even from the 60s to maybe today, your relationship with the judicial system or the police? Has it always been a bit rocky? Well, it, it's, it's, it is rocky in, in as far as there's two sides to that. I mean, there were some that I made friends of because it suited me. And if I was in trouble or somebody who worked for me was in trouble, I could pick the phone up and, they, and go bum bum and they'd go, yeah, don't worry, squashed. And then with me, and I'd give them a few quid. And but that happened regularly all the time in London. It wasn't only me. Any villain you knew that worked in them days, he'll tell you that the first thing you said was, "We got nicked. Um, can we have a deal?" That's the first thing. And if the answer was no, then I'd want a phone call, and I would phone a certain high-ranking police officer in London, in one of the major stations in London. Um, and he would deal with it within two or three hours. They wanted me and Billy to look after certain shops in the West End and they were pawn shops and stuff like that and what they wanted us to do is to go round and collect the money and this that and the other and, and while we had a good relationship with them when we was in trouble I didn't feel neither did Billy that we should be doing that because at the end of the day that's going to make us fall guys any trouble we're going to be the first yes. one well, I mentioned the twins in there not too much because I didn't have a lot of association with them they did offer me and Billy certain work but my stance was the same with them. I didn't need them. I was earning lots of money. You know, I wouldn't alienate them and lots of respect for them. You know, and they treated us well. We met up with them a few times. Um, but that was towards the end when they were 
ready to go and that, you know. Um, so lucky enough, again, we didn't get involved with them, which we could have done because they were looking to pull heavies in uh, to assist. Um, and the problem was I'd done a bit of damage to somebody when I was in prison who had been spouting off their name that they were going to do this, that and the other. But another good friend of mine was um, Johnny Squid. He, Squibby, he was uh, a good friend of theirs. And by the time I came out, he'd already talked to them and squared it. They still wanted to see us, but they wanted to recruit us. And we went, well, if you need us, call, obviously, if we can help from time to time, but we don't really want to know. We do I, know. I'm completely retired now. I'm 73, obviously. Um, I have been involved in late years on different businesses. Um, after 93, I've started two or three different businesses. One of the businesses I ran was a, um, a private parking control company. Uh, but I've not gone into that because that happened after 93. I've only gone up as far as the end of that trial. Um, I have exposed lots of police officers, including some that went on to be chief constables. One of them uh, went on to be the chief constable of Dorset, assistant chief constable of Merseyside, and I'm naming, his name was Owen. He was an inspector when I was involved in a shooting incident in Ilford. Um, again, he went verbaled me up. He said that I'd said this, that and the other. He'd come into the hospital and I'd confessed this, that and the other. Yet the matron from the hospital came there and she said when I went there, I'd been shot. Um, I had a breathing uh, apparatus on. I, there was no conversation with the police officers there. She told them I was in no state. Even if I'd said something, it would have been the ramblings. Mr Blunder had lost eight pints of blood and I was on a drip. But they had said that I'd... And on top of that, the guy that had tourniqueted my leg and, and took me in the ambulance, um, again, he got up and he said, told them that I'd said this, that and the other. Yet yeah, we got the ambulance man there. Um, not only was I in there, shot and dying, um, but my brother was in there. He'd had ammonia put in his face and had been cut. Another friend of ours, Johnny Ferry, had been shot. Um, so it was all in, the, in there, and here's this police officer saying that we're holding conversations, saying that you're going to find these people upside down in the Thames when you find them. Yet the ambulance man came in and gave evidence that there was no conversation in the back of the ambulance. Mr Blundell couldn't breathe. I put the air oxygen mask on him straight away. There was no conversation whatsoever. Mr uh, Billy Blundell was uh, dangerously, uh, sorry, seriously hurt in the face. He was holding bandages to his face and that. There was no conversation whatsoever. I think, I think, yeah, I've achieved, I've achieved a lot business-wise. I would have achieved a lot more if the police hadn't. Uh, I, it's hard to explain. If the police hadn't sort of, I don't know. It, it's them that give you the reputation. It's them that make you. They build you up. Another thing is this: when I when I got nicked for the ice cream, when when we're going to court. We're on, an, we're on a vehicle, on a vehicle, prison van. We've got two armed officers on board. We've got an armed escort front, armed escort back, motorbike at the front and helicopter. And for the eight days that we were for committal, they, they changed the routes each day and everything. And the same coming back. And they tried to get us cat aid in prison. The prison said, no, they're not cat aid prisoners. A bunch of ice cream men. Um, you know, they wouldn't. So when we went back to the prison, we was ordinary. If we were being transported anywhere, top security. And all they were doing really is trying to make us look like a big, wicked gang. So that at the end of the day, when you're convicted, they can go as like the Cray twins and give you a lump of porridge. As it happened, there was only three of us convicted and I got the highest sentence, um, which was four years. You're pleased with the book, you're pleased with what it says and you encourage people to read it as a, as a piece of British history? I've unfolded it as it unfolded to me, the facts. People keep saying, write a book, they've been telling me for a year and I've avoided it, one thing and another. And I've let, left a lot of stuff out of this book, for obvious reasons on some of it. Um, but I didn't make myself a villain, they made me a villain. You know.